Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to the School of Advanced Studies, University of Tumen, open course on the rise and fall of complex societies. Today, we're really honored to have a, a guest speaker, Dr. Frederick Hebert from the National Geographic Society, uh, the, the uh, archeologist in residence there. I'd like to welcome everybody to the School of Advanced Studies. I'm getting an echo. I, I had it on my other monitor, and so I was hearing myself talking back to me. <laughs> um, so uh, Fred today is going to talk on the um, Central Asian, uh, Indo-Aryan um, archaeological work and some oases there that were critical, I think, to understanding some of the developments in the second millennia, and even earlier, third millennia, uh, BC, and I think I'm going to turn it right over to you, Fred, with uh, much thanks for you being here. So it's a great honor to have you. Great. Well, it, it's an honor to be here, Jay, to talk to your uh, uh, group of students. Um, and as Jay said, I am the archaeologist in residence at National Geographic um, Society. So I, I used to teach at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, where, where I still have a, a research position. And, um, but uh, just to give you some background, I, um, I, I collaborate with people around the world. So I work with, with Jay, uh, with your professor um, in Egypt on, on sites in the Delta. Uh, it's, uh, I also work in uh, Mesoamerica on the Maya civilization, and I hope that you will have um, Guillermo de Anda uh, visit your class. He's a colleague of mine. We, we work on this. But what I want to talk to you today about is uh, what was actually my PhD research um, back in the 1980s. And uh, it was done um, to sort of compare and contrast, and I will move straight away to the, the slides. So let's see if this works. Uh, and and I, it really started out as a way to understand the great Bronze Age civilizations of Eurasia. And here's a map that just sort of gives you a, a quick geographic understanding of these uh, great civilizations. Of course, civilization is defined as having monumental architecture, writing, um, uh, complex society, uh, stratified societies, and the such. Um, in general, in Eurasia, it's considered that the um, main centers were Egypt here along the Nile, Mesopotamia from, from uh, Southern Mesopotamia all the way up to Turkey. The Indus River civilization on the border between India and Pakistan all the way from Mahanjo-Daro, a great city um, near the Delta to Harappa near Central Asia. And of course, the Yellow River civilization of ancient China. Um, and that's sort of the way Things were taught when I was a student. These were the great centers of civilization. And that was, uh, you know, one, one would specialize in any one of those areas if you are interested in complex societies. Uh, all of those societies, as you've been dealing with in your class, had a rise and a fall, um, mostly in the third millennium BC, going into the second millennium uh, BC. But, but in fact, very interestingly, especially in, in Eurasia, sort of the end of those civilizations coinciding time-wise, perhaps with, with global climate change. And Jay, I'm sure you've addressed your students with the whole issues of global climate change. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that my professor, when I was a graduate student, basically said, why don't you look at the places in between? Um, which is something I had long been interested in. Um, so I thought like, well, that's really interesting. And uh, 
the, the idea is that this area in between, this is a topographic map of what I call the Indo-Iranian lands. It's also called Middle Asia. It's also called Central Asia. Um, uh, every, every term needs explaining. Um, it is kind of Middle Asia. You've got the Caspian Sea here, down to the Indian Ocean here. Uh, uh, the, the, the lines of this area are completely discretionary. Um, it sort of expands one way or another. But a lot of these sites are not included in those great civilizations. So here you've got the Indus, and here you've got Mesopotamia, and there's a lot of sites, both in areas above a thousand meters, sort of like uh, hilly, sometimes almost mountainous sites, and then down here in uh, the 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 non-patterned area, which are more uh, valleys going out into deserts, and you've got places near in the Indus Valley, in Iran, uh, uh, in Turkmenistan here, uh, Anau, Namazga, and Altin Tepe, these were places that we knew from the Soviet literature, and then out into the desert. Far to the north, you've got the steppe nomads, um, and people considered them to be off the map, like, like a, a completely different world. Um, and th that was the Bronze Age world that we were looking at. Needless to say, from the 1970s, late 1970s, uh, through the 1980s, into the 1990s, continuing today, um, there was this enigma that popped up in this area, uh, not, not, from Mesopotam not from Mesopotamia and not directly from the Indus Valley, uh, and it was, it came from the fact that places like Afghanistan were war torn. And most of the remains that we had came from farmers digging their field or illegal hunting for artifacts. And uh, it was all over the place, especially from Afghanistan, but also every, every country in that area. and. It was really astonishing. I mean, the Metropolitan Museum in New York acquired this shaft hole axe um, made of bronze, uh, gilt in silver and gold, and having iconography that was both Middle Eastern, Indo-European, and even Indus at the same time. And it, it was a remarkable piece, and it, it had no context. Um, same thing with a series of stamp seals, this one made out of gold. Um, so very fine craftsmanship um, here with a very uh, Middle Eastern Indo-European motif on the back with winged goddess and sitting on lions. And, and the stamp seal itself, a compartmented seal that we knew was more home in Central Asia, like uh, Northern Afghanistan, uh, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. So highly interesting, uh, you know, all sorts of very beautiful, rare materials. Uh, there's uh, a, a gold inlay, uh, an inlaid gold lion with lapis and carnelian that would have come from the highlands of Central Asia, either from, from India, Pakistan, or, or Central Asia. Um, and a whole series of carved steatite vessels, the, the, the chlorite or steatite um, being found only selectively in areas of Iran and um, carved both in geometric forms, but also with iconography like snakes. And we keep seeing snakes all the place. This really drove the art historians crazy. Where, where is this? Because the artistry um, some of the things like, like the figurines of, uh, that were made of steatite and limestone were on par with the artistry of the Indus Valley or of Mesopotamia, but, but weren't from there. So it was sort of like they're saying, is there a civilization out there that we don't know? And there were objects that, that were from these collections that, that did resonate like 
Mesopotamian, straight Mesopotamian uh, symbolism. This bull with, with a beard made out of silver, also coming from this enigmatic uh, Middle Asia area. Sort of confusing everybody. A, a stamp seal uh, with on one side, it's made of stone, with one side a lion with a, a snake underneath it that we had only seen that kind of iconography from this group of, of, of un, undocumented artifacts. And on the other side, a, a bull in a very typical Harappan or Indus Valley style. Uh, so everybody's sort of like thinking, like where, where's the civilization, right? Um, more chlorate vessels, and, and we'll, we'll come back and look particularly at, at the uh, compartmented box here with, with four with, with four compartments here. Very interesting. Um, so not knowing where these things came from, you know, uh, we I, I was set with the task to look at Middle Asia and, and think about where they could come from. So just to give you a, a quick idea of the chronology, um, I, I, I use what's called the Namazga sequence up here. Namazga is, is a site here in Turkmenistan. Um, to do this project, I, I learned Russian very quickly and, and um, had had to to get ready for uh, what what was a life changing uh, experience. But we definitely know there was interaction throughout this area in the fourth millennium. Um, in in the third millennium, we see a series, especially along the Kopa Dag foothills, that's of southern Turkmenistan, of, of small cities growing up. And these small cities um, were, were growing up um, along very small rain-fed rain rivers. Um, they had what we call in, in, in uh, anthropological archaeology, very limited catchment area. That means that the amount of food that could be grown around these cities was limited by the rainfall, agriculture, and, and the natural environment around them. We know that there was a third period in this Middle Asia area um, that was, that was uh, perhaps the origins for all of these beautiful artifacts where we see a similar type, as I showed you before, similar type of, of uh, iconograph, iconog iconography. Um, and materials from Mesopotamia, from Iran, uh, from the Indus, and I'll show you, in fact, from China and from the steppe. So this became sort of the task to figure out where this missing civilization uh, was located and, and what its date was and how it ran and why, why is it missing. Um, in 1986, I first went to the Soviet Union. Um, it was, it was a tough time period. I mean, I hate to say it, it probably predated most of you guys. <laughs> but, but I mean, it was, you know, the, 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 the uh, iron border, it was, it was very hard to penetrate. Um, and it, it took me a long time to try and get, but finally I was invited to Moscow um, on a year long educational exchange. Uh, it was a one-time visa only. And I went in 1988 to go study these Bronze Age uh, Middle Asian sites. And the thing I did really, I spent most of my time on was drawing unpainted pottery. Hundreds of thousands of pieces of pottery um, because the pottery gives us the chronology for documenting these Middle Asian sites, right? You know, because they are very finely made. They're, they're made on a wheel and there are minute changes in the rims, uh, in the bodies. And I figured after drawing about 100,000 of these ceramics, I felt it was ready. I was ready to go in the field and actually look at what one of these sites would be. And I was invited by the very famous, illustrious 
Soviet archaeologist, Russian archaeologist, Victor Sarianidi. Victor Sarianidi had a, a career from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, uh, everywhere in Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Afghanistan, uh, finding incredible sites, most of which um, we in the United States or in Europe didn't really know about. It was not easy going out there. This is I, I when we got to to Turkmenistan um, in in the late '80s and going out to visit these these uh, Bronze Age Middle Asian sites. Uh, it, they're located out in the middle of the Karakum Desert. There were no paved roads, and I mean, just getting out to the site was hugely difficult. And you. You look at that landscape, you know, uh, no trees, no water, just scrub vegetation, actually no roads. Like we drove from here, just straight out there, straight north. And we found Victor Sarinidi. Yeah, there he was at his camp. Um, he, had, he had some of the very few pieces of wood um for his tent there he is sitting at his typewriter drinking tea and it's like where are the sites because there are, are no mounds as, as you'll see from other middle eastern I iranian uh indus valley sites they're all mounded no not not in the Middle Asia sites, not, not in the Karakum sites. You walk over the sites and you don't see a mound, but everything that's glittering on the ground, these are all potsherds. The same pottery that I had spent several months in Moscow drawing. It was amazing. It's amazing. This is the site of Kilili. It's the northernmost site in an area north of, of the great medieval city of Merv in Turkmenistan in the heart of the Karakum Desert. And the other thing that's interesting is that Victor had dug down just beneath the surface and there were walls, walls of, of buildings that, that belonged to the Bronze Age that we did not know because there were no mounds. There were a lot of snakes though, I have to tell you. Um, I, I think there were more snakes in the Karakum Desert on all of the sites than in, in any Indiana Jones film, right? So we went up on Hollywood, believe me. Um, and uh, everybody kind of played around with the cobras, not me. Uh, once in a while, the Soviet army would fly over with their helicopters and allow us to take pictures of the, the monumental architecture that was being found in the desert, in these flat desert plains. Huge fortified buildings. These are Victor's excavations at a site called Togolokwan with, with towers at, at the corner. Fortified, super fortified, sitting on top of earlier architecture and an outside wall here. It's almost like either a fortification against people or fortification against the desert, I, I don't know. Um, but inside of the buildings, there were just tons of material. And uh, I mean, the amount of, of archeological material inside of these structures was, was extraordinarily Im impressive and a lot of it were these large industrial vessels and in fact that's a very important point as we try and understand these middle asian sites especially in this time period so he here's a large fortified building with uh, eight towers one on each corner here and and uh towers in front of the entrance here and, and uh, over here on the left as well. Uh, very organized um, and, and inside a lot of 
production areas, a lot of production. And we're in the middle of a desert that has no wood. And at this point, very little water. As we dug down into these buildings, um, the excavations revealed mud brick architecture um, preserved from, from, uh, from a time period of, of the Middle Bronze Age that uh, we, we literally had no idea. And, and these were just coming up and coming up. Here were storage rooms with giant storage jars. Uh, some of the pottery was very unlike the pottery which I drew in Moscow. Some of it had these uh, almost narrative scenes of figures that were applied on the outside, um, making us scratch our heads in, in the sense that like, we were not expecting this type of iconography, this being more of a narrative that would be familiar to the Indo-European tradition of, of narratives with snakes and, and females holding babies. And I mean, um, so, so we're, we're, we're seeing something that, that we were really surprised of coming up in, in this area. Um, some of the burials in the area also surprised us greatly. Here's a, a chariot burial with horses, and chariot wheels, once again, reminding us that we're on the northern edge of Middle Asia and somewhere far to the north is the steppe nomadic society of, of uh, Indo-Europeans. So we decided to uh, put the American team together with the Soviet team, we didn't want to work on wide scale horizontal uh, exposure. This is the American team. That's myself, uh, my, my wife who's an archaeozoologist, and we also had an archaeobotanist who came along. And we, we, the goal of this project was try to integrate, you know, the, the expansive and well-developed Soviet methodologies of archaeology um, with American US of uh, methodologies that really focus on fine scale excavations. Um, we had the help of a wonderful uh, excavator, Oleg Markovich, who, who helped us excavate. He's the greatest wall finder in, in the world. Um, you can see he's, uh, he, he's indulging from a jar of marmalade that had been brought to us by one of these military helicopters on a rope and brought down. And uh, that jar, this jar of marmalade lasted about four hours. Um, that's life in the desert. Well, the, the American team uh, didn't have many resources. This is our photo tower. Um, we're out documenting the wide scale horizontal excavations, uh, just to, to give you a flashback of what it was like to work in the desert in 1988. By the way, uh, during a, 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 a couple of stormy nights, our entire camp uh, blew away. Our tents were, were found a couple of kilometers away um, and uh, we had to go recover them. Well, here is, uh, where we decided to work near a monumental excavation of a, a huge building um, at a site called Gonur, um, this large fortified uh, structure having uh, an, all these workshop rooms, uh, more areas for storage here, um, and, and a, quite a lot of, of elite material. This is a site called Gonur North, and this, this is the American excavations. Well, here we are, we're looking into the American excavations and I must say, Victor Sarinidi was not happy with our research because we found no walls and no burials and no intact artifacts, which he was finding every day. But what we did find was a, a giant trash heap of of stratified 
industrial debris. You see the charcoal, layers of charcoal and ash and, and lime. I mean, we were clearly excavating through layer after layer of industrial debris. And it was very, very productive for our archaeozoologists and our archaeobotanists. And it was very productive from my point of view, getting a very fine radiocarbon stratigraphy that would go along with our pottery. It could become the key to these widespread ex excavations. And uh, in fact, most of my work is, is on uh, sort of radiocarbon analysis. And here we are out in the area of the desert oasis. Uh, it's called Margiana. And our, our data comes primarily from the site of Gonor Tepe. I was able over a couple of years also to work in the Copa Dog foothills and get a longer radiocarbon sequence as well as in Uzbekistan and get a, a radiocarbon sequence. But the bottom line is that these enormous sites out in the desert, fortified sites, are, are pretty tight in their chronology. Um, they have basically three major periods of fluorescence from the late third millennium through the uh, early second millennium here. I, I call it the Bactria or, or Victor Sarinidi and I, we call it the Bactria Margiana Archaeological Complex because it's Bactria and Margiana Archaeological Complex. Um, that's not a good enough title for some of my colleagues who call it the Oxus Civilization. That's another way of period. And then we'll also talk about this last period, Takarbai, at, at the end of the second millennium, which is also a period of great fluorescence in the area. So now that we have the sort of chronology figured out, you have to put it in the perspective of those other riverine civilizations, China, the Indus, and Mesopotamia. And you realize, actually, we are. Um, looking at a time period, basically at the same time period that those cities of Mesopotamia and the Indus were disappearing. So what's up, right? And, and that, that really became, that, that became the, the next thing that, that we worked out. What, what's up? How, how could this possibly be that, that our main time periods for the fluorescence of these, um, you know, urban sites out in the desert were fluorescing, right? Uh, now, here we are out in the desert. I'm just giving you a map of, of the archeological sites. Um, uh, this is the mayor of Oasis. This is Murgov River. It's called Margiana out here. Um, and we see a, a, a very much of a tendency to go from the Bronze Age sites where, where we did that chronological work here to um, the period of the Achaemenid Empire, uh, time of Alexander the Great, to, to the medieval period. So a gradual reduction in the pulling back of, of the river oasis. Uh, this is probably um, co coincident with the same environmental changes that we see in Mesopotamia or in the Indus Valley. Um, but in this case, rather than like, you know, ending the cities of Mesopotamia or such, uh, these sites just moved, right? You know, the river, the river retracted and, and they came down and, and, and that became very interesting. As you can see, the sites are arranged along what clearly was some sort of uh, irrigation agriculture. And, um, and that was very interesting because this is not a time period where, where big agriculture, big irrigation agriculture happened because as I mentioned, the foothill sites of the Copa Dai, the typical sites are rainfall, small river uh, agriculture. Needless to say, as we moved into sort of more analysis, we look at these oasis sites out here and compare them to the foothill sites here. And we realize that these foothill sites, like mo most of the riverine sites in Mesopotamia or the Indus Valley 
uh, would have would have reacted in the this same area according to rainfall. These rivers, so so in other words, the foothill rivers, they had they, they would sow their grains um, in the fall and harvest them in, in the late spring, right? The desert rivers, their headwaters were in the high mountains, sometimes in the Himalayas, um, often with snow topped mountaintops. And in fact, what we see in terms of the uh, river ecology is the complete opposite, that they would sow their grains in late spring and harvest in the winter. In fact, I like to think that this time period when the desert oases were being formed at, at, the, at, at the crisis period for Mesopotamia, for the Indus Valley, that this was a time period of agricultural revolution for, for Central Asia, right? They moved out into the deserts, reversed their agricultural system, and all of a sudden, you know, they, they went boom and, and had an irrigation-based uh, society that, that was fluorescing at the same time that Mesopotamian and Indus cities were in crisis. So doing a reconstruction of that, we look at it as you know uh, the river um, having large irrigation canals cut in. Uh, we know from the ethnobotany that we had wheat and barley fields. Um, they also used the local um, riverine um, vegetation and and the desert desert things. And their their settlements were fortified, and they were were sort of structured throughout the oasis. So all of a sudden we could see how people could prosper at a time in Central Asia, at a time where, where other areas um, were not prospering. In addition, the interesting phenomena, when we, we, we go out from our research area and we were working here, here's, <clears throat> Uh, the area of that large fortified building. Here's our little industrial sounding. We found late in 1989, we found a small nomadic site nearby, a, a step site, which would have been more familiar to the Urals than to Turkmenistan. And th this, was, this was great surprise to us to find it in such proximity. And um, really, it, it comes down to the fact that, that our, our idea of the steppe world up here, Tumen is probably, are you steppe or forest steppe? Anyway, um, you're over here somewhere. Uh, this, the idea of interaction between the steppe and, and this area, the northern edge of greater Middle East uh, was considered, uh, unapproachable, but if you look at uh, complex nomadism, right, you know, large scale migration in the area, we know historically that, that transhumans could do that. They, they would go, it was very traditional for these um, complex semi-sedentary nomads to go on annual routes north of the RLC all the way down and connecting to these areas of the desert oasis. So in fact, the development of the oasis allowed for interaction to the north, as well as to the Iranian plateau, the Indus and Central Asia uh, and uh, Mesopotamia. This type of oasis economy, wheat, barley, sheep, and goat also spread from the highlands, from the steppe area into Eastern Central Asia. This is the area of Xinjiang. So here's Lake Asakul, here's Lake Baikal. This is the edge of uh, the Taklamakan Desert. And here during the late Bronze Age, you have a series of 
desert oasis sites that developed uh, very non-Chinese, very Central Asian. The dates of these date exactly, another radiocarbon uh, study that we did uh, with uh, earlier period, just at the time of our um, uh, fluorescence in the Bactrian and Margiana oases, and then a later period where the, um, the, the Xinjiang cultures really fluoresced themselves. They had their own fluorescence. What's interesting is not only do we know that their economy was based not on the, the Yellow River rice and, and millet economies, but wheat, barley, sheep, and goat, and their burials were done with mud bricks in exactly the same style as what Victor was finding in Turkmenistan. So clearly related Central Asian group. Obviously, this particular group is very well known, unfortunately, mostly from, from unauthorized excavations because in the Taklamakan Desert, the preservation is so good. The textiles, the cordage, um, and the naturally mummified individuals. Uh, these are related to the Western Central Asian peoples, the irrigation agriculturalists of Middle Asia. So let's just think about the impact. Now that, that we've looked at, at these particular settlements, um, and we, we, we understand the chronology, we understand the economy of it. Let's, let's think about that whole array of enigmatic uh, artifacts that, that were out there from the Iranian plateau, from, from the Indus Valley. Uh, this, for example, a series of, of um, gold fragments found in Afghanistan called Fulal. Um, we see the same iconography that we, we see in, in the desert oasis of Margiana. We think that these are perhaps um, itinerant merchants or, or traders who are coming in and they're actually Central Asians in this area. This from Nosharo in the Indus Valley from the very last level, the, the, the post Harappan levels, we see the same Central Asian assemblage of artifacts, especially small finds. Um, especially metals. Uh, this from the site of Shah Dad in Southern Iran. Um, it's, it's possible that there is a link between these Central Asian oases and, and the development of, of itinerant um, metallurgists who are moving around and uh, you know, creating, creating uh, the, the Central Asian um, pieces outside of Central Asia. We're, we're not quite sure what, what the mechanism is. And we're pretty sure that it, it comes back to, to these sites in the desert oasis. So let's just go back you know, uh, to um, uh, about 2005, 2006, went back out to, to visit Victor uh, with a National Geographic team. And uh, what he had found was really, in the same area where, where we were just finding walls and fortifications and, and a lot of pottery, he had found the cemetery. And all of a sudden, we really knew that this was the homeland for that whole enigmatic group of, of artifacts that, that had come on the market in the uh, 1970s and 1980s. Um, the cemetery was very large. Uh, just some of the... Uh, Basically, they scrape down the surface and, and, and uh, document the, the location of the bears, and, and some of them are excavated. Um, and they're all just extraordinarily rich. And it comes from the production area in the desert oases. Um, e everything from, from elite burials to, uh, to regular middle class burials, I mean, uh, everything. But, but the Artistry and the and and the iconography is spot on for all of those chance finds that, that came from the 70s and 80s. Um, here's one of those compartmented boxes that we only knew from the market, and this came from from uh, burial 92, 
in at, at Gonar, and uh, we finally have the actual context. And, and we know that its time period is about 1900 BC. Uh, we have horse burials from that time period, right? So, so we can we can actually, you know, put put a date and a context to when we see horses that would have come from the steppe area. Uh, the artistry from these particular uh, Turkmenistan desert oasis sites is really at the level of the royal tombs of Ur in Mesopotamia. Here's a flower with, with a, a gold center and, and alabaster uh, flower petals. Uh, a series of mosaic pieces that are, are so astonishing that, that they haven't even been completely put all together on with. And continued excavations of the massive amount of, of industrial um, activity in this area. Whoops. And I, I just want to go back to this uh, context a little bit to talk about economy and trade as well. I mean, even during the Bronze Age, uh, there were very few um, natural resources available out in the desert, aside from the irrigated uh, oasis. But we know this is this is a, uh, 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 a pottery kiln, two two tiered pottery kiln. We we know that there was also industrial level metal working and stone working, and yet. There's no metal or stone out in the desert oasis. There's no wood to do it. So the agricultural system and the economy and the ideology are all so interconnected in this time period, which fluoresces at, a, at, at the same time that other um, large riverine societies are, are collapsing. So one has, has to think like, what is driving this? because they're going to have to bring all the raw materials, the steatite, the copper, the gold, the silver, it, the alabaster up to these sites, manufacture them here. And we, we know this is now the source for, for where these things are happening. So they're basically bringing raw materials up to the desert oases, manufacturing these things, and apparently exporting them. And uh, these things are, are, are known quite far and wide. Here's, here's a, a Bactrian camel on a, on a silver vase. The artistry is, is uh, something that, that would definitely put this at, at the level of, of you know, one of the most complex societies, civilizations uh, in the world, but it's a place in between. And uh, the work there in the desert continues and it, it continues to this day. Um, and it's it's really one of the most amazing unknown spots uh, I think in world history. So, just a couple of recent finds: uh, two mosaic eagles um, made of steatite and alabaster. And uh, uh, I'm only sorry to say that that Victor Sarniti passed away about two years ago. So his legacy is is being carried on. Um, but but here's part. Here he is putting part of that huge mosaic together. Um, uh, ready for any questions or anything. That's it for the presentation. Thank you, Fred. That is amazing. I mean, I had no idea what was going on out there. Yeah. Um, I, I, one of the things, well, let, let me open up to, to the class first, or if anyone out who's watching the streaming has questions. Um, you guys have some questions or, or comments? Yeah, Artem. Um, yeah, like, thank you a lot for this. It was really interesting. Uh, but then there is this uh, idea with their lifespan that they well lasted from like end of the third the third millennia of uh, well BC to the like middle to even end of second millennia BC, but then what happened next? Uh, like because collapse doesn't always mean that everything disappears. 
was there any maybe like remaining evidences of the next kind of civilization that came after like there was alexandrian like uh things like uh alexander the great stuff or and was it something else in, before that or it just completely disappeared before greek uh conquests no i will uh i, I will screen share uh uh one, one of the illustrations if i can get back to to where we were um okay i don't know if you if that's on yeah that's good so let's see which way is it um so if we look at at this particular um picture it's the map uh it, it's our turn, exactly as you said we we have a chronology of occupation here in the whole Merv oasis the the whole area today the, the modern city is called mari it's 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 over here and our earliest bronze age sites are up here and what we see is the continuation of the oasis civilization nonstop really you know because because it, it does its carrying capacity just shifts right if it if it was you know irrigated you know during the um middle bronze age up 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 here you know uh, by the late bronze age the the oasis had moved to here. Um, and then there is an early Iron Age occupation right here. It's a, it's, it's a period called the Yaz civilization. Um, uh, beginning around, you know, 1500 to, to 1200 BC. And the Yaz um, occupation seems to be just, uh, you know, it, it seems to be a continuous occupation from the Bronze Age. Needless to say, it you know uh, there 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 is a change in uh, industrial production. There is a change in iconography and and um, the the way the artifacts are are done. And it mostly comes from the fact that that um, there there's a shift towards handmade painted pottery. And we actually think that that may go back to um, the fluorescence of the um, of the complex agricultural nomads from Xinjiang, from China. As I mentioned in, in Xinjiang in China, you know they, 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 those desert oases, which were also um, sheep and goat, wheat and barley based, uh, they, they fluoresced later. They, they probably were inspired by these oases um, and that that by the Iron Age, the, the oasis continued, but it had, it had adopted the technologies and the iconography of those steppe populations, um, probably from the highlands of, of um, Kazakhstan, from the steppe of Kazakhstan and the highlands of Xinjiang. And yes, we, we, we see continuous here. These are the Ecumenid, these are the, the, the sites of the time of Alexander the Great. We have later periods here called Yaz two and three, um, and of course the medieval, me medieval city itself. And if you can look very carefully, it continues to be the square, fortified uh, sites. So I, I have another pop publication on the the continuity of this specific type of desert oasis. Um, uh, architecture, which I, I can send you a digital copy of, um, to suggest that those fortified Bronze Age sites with their towers and their thick walls are, are the origins and the inspiration for the medieval, as we call them, kalas of uh, Central Asia, fortified um, stations in the desert. So it is really kind of a uh, uh, a, a non-stop. I, I don't believe there was a collapse in these desert oases. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Now it's much clearer. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Alyssa. 
Alyssa, go ahead. Alyssa? Alyssa, you're still muted if you're talking. Ah, ah, okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, you were just talking about these frontiers around settlement. So I just wanted to know, like, were there some indications of wars or um, what were they used for more for protecting for animals or climate? Yeah. Or, yeah. I, 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 that's a great question, Alyssa. Um, I, you know, I have to think that it, it's all three of those things. I mean, uh, the, this is, this is, the 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 northern frontier of this whole um greater middle east uh world right and uh they're obviously in contact with the the steppe populations um there there may have been reasons to defend themselves against steppe nomads coming in um it it, it may if there's anything that's close to analogy it's it's northern afghanistan Northern Afghanistan um, is, is a steppe desert environment where traditional architecture are all these sort of fortified um, uh, large buildings slash towns. And what you do is you, you take your animals inside at night and uh, there were also living quarters in there. The, the difference in Afghanistan is that, um, I mean, that was their purpose. Here in, in, the, in the Bronze Age um, and late Bronze Age world of, of the Central Asia deserts, um, it, it seems like, according to our archaeozoologists and our ethnobotanists, we, we don't find those thick deposits of, of where they would have brought animals in. Um, but there is a, a lot of, of metal production, stone production, and pottery production inside. So maybe they're protecting the production areas. It's, it's uh, um, and I don't know what they would protect them against, you know, whether it was invaders or whether it was the climate. I mean, certainly in Northern Afghanistan, the fortified um, buildings of Northern Afghanistan are for both, right? They're for both. Certainly the, the quality and the design of the fortifications suggests a really well-developed military technology with the towers set up, you know, for maximum archery coverage on the walls and things like that. Um, they're, I mean, they're, and, they're, and the construction is it almost looks like it's Roman or something. They're so, they seem to be so geometrically precise. I mean, they, they really knew what they were doing when they laid it out and, and built it. They, 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 they apparently did. And I mean, um, I, I like to think of, of Central Asia as the uh, original melting pot, right? It's, you know, pre-Silk Road, pre-Silk Road, and yet they, um, they obviously um, were, you know, were, were just receiving ideas from a much wider um, sort of network of, of civilizations and concepts and, religions and, and, and ideologies than what we were expecting, right? They're not at all insular, right? And so you, you, you do have things that, that, that look like, I mean, it looks like Parthian architecture. And one wonders, yeah. <laughs> if, you know, if, if it, um, it's a big debate about whether, whether it just sort of um, developed indigenously um, which I, I, I find that hard to believe because it's so, you know, it, it, it's so amazing and it resonates so much. And I, I just have to believe even the, in the third millennium and throughout the second millennium, there were people moving around. There were people oh. moving around, introducing ideas, introducing ideology um, and, and uh, introducing, you know, skills such as mathematics and, and uh, architecture. Um, I, I, I think, the idea, of course, you know, the idea of, of separate centers of civilization is th th this is counter to that. This is this is you know sort of sort of blows that all away, right? You know, did yeah. did the Indians have connections with Mesopotamia? I mean, of course, of course, uh, just like Egypt had 
a lot of connections um, with surrounding uh, civilizations. Yeah, I mean, just like we're, we learn a lot about the maritime trade routes, you know, being very early in, in Southern Asia, um, you know, all the way to the Middle East. And so, um, you know, before the Silk Road, we don't tend to think much about it, but there must have been a series of kind of growth in, in regional trade areas that then were interconnect, became interconnected as the Silk Road eventually. Yeah. One, 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 of, one of the things that I, I think the, the Turkmenistan data points to is this time period um, at the beginning of the second millennium where, where we have um, a, a lot of evidence for the development of um, a, a, a symbiosis, symbiosis between steppe nomads and the desert agriculturalists. I mean, it was really, it, 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 it became an essential part of their existence to, to have this symbiotic relationship, right? It was not, you know, again, the, the question about warfare is like, what, was it an antagonistic relationship where, where the nomads coming in and raiding? And I, I don't think so. I think they were, I, I think it was, uh, it, it became the origins of, of what we see um, as, as long distance uh, nomadism, um, where, where the nomads come in and use the, the fallow uh, agricultural fields, bring trade items in, and, 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 and they travel over great distance. And, um, and it may be, I, ha I have a, a, a student who, who focused particularly on this, um, uh, also someone whose literature is very worth reading, Michael Frechetti, I, uh, and Jay, I can send you some references on that. And yeah. he really has focused on, you know, the the, the mountain roots for cultural uh, diffusion. And of course, for us to get wheat and barley and sheep goat, um, you know, complex, you know, basically the Western Central Asian stuff in China by the second millennium, I mean, you you necessarily have to go over the mountains. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this this seems like one of those uh, an archetype example of these people who who live in this transition zone between, you know, the environmental transition zone that allows them to diversify, take advantage of the different, you know, the pastoralist, you know, and the and the sedentary relationship. Um, it seems perfect a perfect example of it. And 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 because. Because they're um, for the for the agriculturalists, because their um, their water is not dependent on rainfall. It's it's based on the river flow, and the river flow depends on you know glaciers melting. Um, they're, they're not at all resp responding to the same issues that that have been discussed for Mesopotamia or for the Indus, which uh, um, you know. And by the way, uh, th those tend to be all very regional reactions in any event, you know. Yeah. Um, but 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 I mean, here in in Central Asia, it's like like Artem, as you said, you know, the o the as you asked, the the oasis doesn't disappear; it just moves, and uh, that's that's how they react to that kind of stress. Uh, just one last comment on the fortifications. I mean, a good fortification serves its purpose if it's never attacked because people look at it and they don't want to attack it, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, yeah, that's not worth it. <laughs> uh, Artem. Yes, another question. Um, we had Eric Klein last week here. And uh, he was talking about uh, this great uh, Mediterranean, late Bronze Age um, civilizations and their collapse. And one of the points of their collapse was that uh, the kind of connection with the teen sources from somewhere around the, well, Middle Asia, in fact, yep. Central Asia, yep. uh, yep. have been somewhat broken. Um, what could have been uh, happening to this connection maybe? And what were really the connection of uh, these periods that you were talking about now? Because it's not uh, like 
totally coincidental with no, totally like um, uh, what Eric was uh, talking about. Like, what were connection like except for Mesopotamia and India here? No, Atav, that, that's a great question because um, uh, there there's a series of um, specific type of burials that um, that show up um, in that third period in, in our desert oasis. So uh, if, if our first one in the late third millennium is where, where the oasis started, the second period, the, the BMAC or the Oxus civilization is the middle of the last period is a time period which is um, mostly distinctive for its, um, it, it also has a fluorescence, it also has great, great production and technology and everything like this. But, um, you know, it, it, it was, it's notable for the type of burials that they have. Um, and burial traditions are very specific um, in, in terms of economy, ecology, ideology in particular. So these these burials are shaft hole um, burials that that um, have that that go down into the ground and then and then turn. Um, what, what's interesting is that during this late late Bronze Age period, you see shaft hole um, tombs sort of develop um, throughout the area. Not only are they in in, in Middle Asia and Central Asia, uh, you find them in Iran. Uh, you find them in in uh, um, some places in Mesopotamia. Uh, Paul Lapp, um, who who did uh, archaeology of um, of Jordan, um, actually uh, before he passed away, he was excavating a series of shaft hole burials um, that that looked, from my point of view surprisingly similar, it, at least recognizably, um, it, they looked sort of like that last phase of Central Asia. Again, it's ideas that are moving around. It, that, it doesn't necessarily mean that there are Central Asians in uh, Jordan and Israel. It, it just means that, that you know, um, th this idea that, that I, I think it had to do, th that they are related with the, um, complex uh, ag uh, nomadic agricultural complex that we see develop with these large period, large scale interaction, right? You know, the, the people who came and had their trading camp nearby and then, then would go. Um, you, you see them pop up also, you know, between 1500 and 1200 BC. Um, so there is, there, there is a possibility that, um, that, the that, that this exchange of knowledge of this thing, it went all the way from Central Asia to, to what Eric was talking about um, with, with the decline. And, and, you know, maybe, I don't know what he said. I, I, ha, I, um, I, I would love to have, have seen what he said, but, you know, maybe the collapse of the Bronze Age in, in uh, the Levant and, and, and uh, Egypt and, and that area, Syria, maybe that's a little bit of a misnomer, right? Maybe it's, it's not correct to say, it, it, it's not that there was a collapse, but just a change in behavior. So that is very coincident, which with that's going on in, in Central Asia. Yeah, I think Eric would fall in the school of, of it's a collapse that was followed by a dark age and, and you know, the Eastern Mediterranean there, but. Um, <laughs> um, he writes books about that, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but certainly his, his views are, are changing a lot, I think, as far as, you know, the, you know there being no single cause of, of, yeah. of collapse and, yeah. and that being a very complex there, issue. There's a lot of new information from the Eastern Mediterranean, from Greece, from, from, uh, from Crete in particular about about that time period. So um, yeah, he, he's very observant of all those, of, of that, you know, all of a sudden it's like, it's not as dark as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had a couple of questions. Oh, oh hold on. Alyssa, go ahead. 
um, because we were talking about this um, connections between these different um, regions, like Mesopotamia and Egypt and all that. I wanted to know like what was like the relationship between them like more like competitive, like, okay, we need to advance because the others advance, that's for that we can get more goods and stuff. Or was there like kind of like cooperation? Like you said that the oasis was like a part where they um, like melted a lot of gold and tin. So could they like cooperate it? Like, okay, this is like easier if you do like in the middle because then we don't have to go that kind of ways or, yeah. Well, uh, that, that's a great question. I, 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 I don't think that, that, you know, there's a single answer for that. Um, I, I, I Generally, when, when I teach about the Silk Road, you know, we talk about a, a defined uh, construct, right? Uh, the Silk Road is a very organized um, imperial pattern. So it, it asked, you know, you, you basically have to have a, a super strong central government, you know, like, like Rome, to have a road system or, or the Han Dynasty um, in China, where where you have an authoritarian system that is setting up a very organized, I, th I think we're pretty clearly pre that type of, of, of social organization at, at this, during, during the Bronze Age. So we're, we're, we're not talking about like, you know, um, somebody in Mesopotamia setting up uh, a desert oasis. It, it, I mean, certainly the, the um, the sites in Central Asia um, uh, seem unique enough and distinctive in their in their architecture, their social organization, uh, their economy um, that that they they don't they they I would never call them colonies, right? And so I would not say that that there is a central government organizing all these things. But certainly, as Eric noted, you know, there, there were people in, in, in the Levant, even, even in, you know, in Anatolia in, in Turkey, who, who were looking for specific commodities that came specifically from Central Asia. I mean, give you a great example, lapis lazuli, the beautiful um, blue stone that was used on uh, Tutankhamun's funerary goods in Egypt comes from Afghanistan. Um, the tin, there is likely a very big source of, of tin in Central Asia. Um, now, what we don't know, are there other tin sources out that, you know, so sometimes uh, those questions are hard to, ex to, to answer. Um, Especially if if the if the resource w is a, like a placer deposit, that means a surface deposit, right? And that's that's a lot of, of how um, uh, minerals are 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 placed in the ground. Gold, for example, and and those get used up, right? So it may be that that the tin sources were used up, and it's like you're you're not going to go back and find it because it got used up. So, but but we do know that 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 Central Asia definitely was a source for tin. Definitely, it was the source for lapis lazuli and probably a lot of other things. Yeah. So so I, I would see it more as you know um, the fact is that people from from Egypt to Mesopotamia to China were aware of the resources in Central Asia. And I have to think that, um, that forever and ever, Central Asia was actually considered to be, you know, uh, a place of great natural resources to the point that you have to think about the motivation of Alexander the Great to go all the way to Bactria and to Afghanistan, right? He wasn't going there because there was nothing there. He was going there because there were people and resources that he wanted to dominate. Think about that, right? Yeah. Even, even to the point where he intermarried there, right? Correct. I mean, Correct. I mean uh, establish a relationship. And, and um, you know, there some sometimes, especially with the historians, there's this idea that that 
that, you know, he, he took his armies, you know, across unoccupied territory. And it's like, no, there, there's no, there's no reason to think that Alexander the Great wanted to take his armies all the way to back to, to you know, the, he set up a city in Northern Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, and, and there, you know, it wasn't because there was no city there. It was because he wanted to dominate the, the very rich, agriculturally rich, resource rich, population rich areas of, of Central Asia. I mean, so his motivation, yeah, I think is reflects very much on the motivations from the Bronze Age where people knew about these resources and uh, uh, I, they, they just didn't have an Alexander the Great at that time, as far as we know. Maybe they did. <laughs> uh, a, a question on the bronze. Uh -huh. I, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure they must have had, because they were well connected, access to tin. So they're probably bringing in tin bronze. Because Dennis the other day, you know, was talking about the bronze working. Yeah. Um, over there by the Urals, and he said, well, it, it, it was arsenic bronze, not tin, because there's a lot of natural arsenic in the, in the, um, the, the uh, minerals there. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in Central Asia, it's all, it's all tin bronze, um, but on the Iranian plateau in, in Iran, um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating mix of arsenic bronzes and, and tin bronzes there. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the motivations for a transition from arsenical bronze to, uh, to a tin bronze isn't clear since um, tin, tin was just a rarer thing. Again, it may be access to, to the tin resource. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in your article, you mentioned some cenotaphs. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of curious what the context of those, because it's kind of unusual, you would think, to, you know, it, it suggests some sort of either a strong hierarchy or religious ideology associated with it. Yeah. So, so for us, when, when we talk about, uh, about um, and, and of course, it partly it comes from the, the Russian literature, but partly it comes from the, from the burial tradition of um, ha having burials with bodies and and with goods and that within the same context of a of a cemetery or or sometimes um within a structure you you find sort of ritual offerings of, of burial goods right and those are what we call cenotaphs and uh they're they're found sort of uh contemporaneously uh, it's not clear. Maybe there's a cenotaph associated with a certain burial. It, that that's also not clear. You know, we are we, we, Jay. One one of the things that has never been resolved for the Bronze Age of Central Asia is um, what what was the status of some sort of accounting literacy um, and, and things like that. We don't have any writing. From the Bronze Age, so so we don't know that much. We can't we can't say well, you know, it was basically a Near Eastern thing. There are a couple of um, indications that that um, they were aware of of the writing system, especially the Indus writing uh, system. And uh, but but that would all predate the fluorescence of the um, desert oasis. So that would be. Um, like 2,500, 20, 27 to 2,500 BC, um, it seemed that um, they, they did adopt uh, sort of maybe a numeric uh, numbering system and things like that, uh, that suggests that they had much closer ties to, to the Indus and to Mesopotamia than, than what we had previously thought. But, you know, apparently it didn't stick, which is interesting. When you look at that monumental architecture and, and you see that, um, but but we can't tie it directly into either Indus, like let's go back to the cenotaphs. You can't uh, tie them directly to the Indus system, uh, ideology system, uh, or, or, or Mesopotamia. It seems to be kind of unique in Central Asia to have these, 
these uh, ritual depo burial deposits without any bones whatsoever. Um, you did have some inscribed shirts. Uh, you know, we we have we have shirts with um, pot marks on them. Yeah, for, for sure, pottery marks, and uh, the those are um, uh, again most of them come from the time period uh, that is earlier than the desert oasis. But people were still, you know, I I have to think that that they're they're markers for industrial production, right? You you you'll see signs on on pottery. Um, and um, and sometimes painted on, but but usually usually they're they're just impressed on, on the the so so those giant um, storage pots. Yeah. If, you, if you if I I'm not going to go back to it, but but you'll notice that that the bases are the, the, they're concave, right? That's because when those giant storage vessels are made, they're made on a. Uh, a uh, a frame, a, a pottery thing. Those things often had symbols um, sort of engraved in them. So it appears on the pottery. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And, and that persists there. Uh, and even I've, I've written about the, the idea that, um, that they had um, played with or adopted a form of, of proto-Elamite. And Elamite is a uh, proto-Elamite is an undeciphered language from from uh, the Iranian plateau, um, which looks it, it's more it's more Harappan than it is um, you know cuneiform, and uh, so a series of, of symbols, um, but it, it kind of dropped out. Okay, yeah, that's what I was thinking. That I saw that uh, etched on the rim of a shirt or something. Yep, yep. No, 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 that, and and that that well, that shirt, that's a proto elamite shirt, right? You know, well, it's not. It's it's possibly a proto elamite. It's possibly a uh, a um, Central Asian. Yeah. Theory. One of the few examples of that of that writing system, then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, um, that that I. That, in two thousand and four, I I um. We, we, we made quite a stink <laughs> about a stamp steel that was found in this 27 to 25 um, period um, that, that really looked like it was uh, a finely made inscribed stamp seal. And that would have, that, that would have really um, changed the perspective on this. And, and um, you know, I, I, I don't think that, that you can, my advisor at that time, uh, Robert Dyson, congratulated me and uh, and said, well, you know, one is no good. Go find a hundred more. <laughs> uh, explain explain to the students what, why it would be really significant to find a stamp seal like that. Well, so a stamp seal would be, you know, that final hallmark of what is classically known as a civilization, right? So, you know, all of a sudden you'd have to change that first map of world civilizations and and add the Oxus civilization or whatever you want to call what I just showed you is uh, uh, they don't like the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex so, so Ox, call it the Oxus civilization I mean it really then then all of a sudden it would be sort of that final hallmark of of you know quote unquote civilizations did they have writing or not um, you know. Uh, given everything, given the monumental architecture, given the complex um, uh, organization of elite areas and non-elite areas, um, given the high level of production and given the enormous amount of trade back and forth, especially the production in an area that didn't have metal or stone. I mean, the only thing that's lacking is, is some form of accounting system. Now, personally, I, I can't imagine that they didn't have an accounting system, right? I mean, it's just, I, I cannot believe that they didn't have a, a system of recording things down. We haven't found it. 
maybe they were they had something like a kipu that that didn't persist right maybe they had some sort of perishable material that had their whole ideology outlined and written down um i i can't believe that they they had a society that was that highly developed without having some way to record things especially given the fact that we know that they knew about mesopotamian they knew about the indus they more than likely were highly aware of what was going on in the in the step and and down into East Asia and and China. I mean, in general, and this is my ideological perspective. I think you know, five thousand years ago, people were much more aware of you know the the distant parts of the world than we give them credit. I think you're absolutely right on that. Yeah. So uh, just a, a couple of footnotes. The, the kipu, of course, is the knotted system that the Inca would use. Right. You know, so yeah. they used it on cords and there's very few examples that have survived. There are some, um, actually more than you, you would kind of realize. And, and actually someone was just doing some mathematical deciphering and, and getting some idea of how it was used. As, yeah. Remember, we talked about monomic devices, you know, um, or, or systems, and, and we think that the kipu was more of a monomic system that it, it, it reminded you of all the things that you needed to, to remember in, in record keeping or mythology. Um, and then, of course, the seals are used to, to make an official mark to, to, to close off documents or, or um, put on top of a, a sealed vessel when you're, when you're shipping and doing business transactions. So, so, you know, so obviously it, it, it's one of those hallmarks that we were talking about with civilizations, so like Fred was saying. Um, oh, it, the, uh, back on the ports again, I'm, I'm, you know, the, the, conf, the, the, just the design was so fine. I'm wondering, are there similar style ports in China in this time period? That would be, seem a reasonable place for, to diffuse from people who are used to dealing with, with, both the peaceful relationship with the steps, but also a hostile one. You know, the step peoples are known to, to get, yeah. raid, you know, to, to participate in raiding is one of their activities. Well, you know, I, I, obviously China is, is, is a um, well-known example for, you know, assuming that, that the um, uh, step nomadic tribes were hostile. I mean, the Great Wall of China, right? Um, there are needless to say, Great walls uh, that that go all all the way to the Caspian Sea, actually, right? You know, um, and and so so this idea of um, interaction or or hostility with with the step populations in in particular, um, you know, the, uh, the 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 fact is, I again, you know, I don't always see interactions with with nomadic uh, societies as being hostile as much as being useful. I mean, in China, um, they, they had no access to horses except for in Central Asia. And there, there are a lot of indications that, that the hermetically sealed Chinese society of the Bronze Age was not hermetically sealed, right? Uh, that there are um, strong suggestions that that there was a lot of trade and interaction going all the way back even to the Bronze Age, and again um, the the surprises of finding um, that Middle Eastern uh, wheat, goat, sheep, barley um, complex in Xinjiang it, it it keeps creeping over you know it it it's uh, it's, it's right on the edge of, of um, the, the Yellow River Bronze Age societies, you know, by, by 1700 BC, right? So um, that, there's not a lot of research on that, but, but there, there's a tremendous amount uh, of, of indications that, that um, th those lines of communications were wide open. Yeah. 
and in particular, Victor Mayer, M-A-I-R, from, from University of Pennsylvania, has been focused on, you know, trying to work with the Chinese to open up their, their idea that, that Chinese society, Chinese, ancient Chinese civilization did not develop in a vacuum. Um, and, and slowly, I've been to several conferences in China where, where this notion is, is accepted. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's amazing how much things have changed, um, you know, in, in the last couple of decades. And um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, to tell you the truth, it's a really exciting time to be studying the rise and fall of civilizations. <laughs> I mean, first of all, given given our current situation, but but second of all, to realize that that you know, you you think this was all written in a book somewhere, right? Yeah. It's not. It's not. It, it just keeps changing all the time. But there's um there's a, a real bias, and I, I I talked about it in my dissertation work, in this core periphery relationship that we're very core centric. And so yeah. if we study the Aztecs, we, we think of Tenochtitlan and that's it, right? If we, you know, if we study Bronze Age civilizations in the second millennium, we look at the Harappans or, or like Fred said, you know, the, the, you, know, right. the, you know, four or five areas where, where you have supposedly autophonous development, right? right. Independent development of civilizations you know, following, you know, Whitfogel's hydraulic hypothesis. Um, but, that's where we looked. And, and when we start looking in between these places, suddenly you realize it's not, you know, it, it's not as binary as, as we like to think of it, that there's this big continuum of development going on everywhere. And, and like Fred had said, you know, people were really well connected. They, they knew what was going on. They, you know, sometimes more as legend, uh, you know, with, with just infrequent contact, but oftentimes with, with, with steady contact. And by the way, you know how we, we started out talking about Archaim, and uh, um, there are uh, strong connections between these desert oases and 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 that step phenomena, right? Especially in in sort of like you know structure and and ideology, and you you think about like you know where where did that fortified architecture from Archaim come from, right? And you think that it is contemporary with the fluorescence of the fortified architecture in the desert oases of Central Asia. And it's not that far. I mean, it's really interesting. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, I give, I, I give the, the, the mobility of, of the step adaptation a lot of credit in you know, in really being sort of the conveyor belt of ideas um, throughout Asia, throughout Eurasia, right? That, you that? Yeah. That, that step belt, I mean, you know, uh, in, in later periods, uh, the, that step belt uh, created sort of a, a, a large theological connection that went from Korea to Afghanistan to Anatolia. And you've got things like, you know, the types of crowns that, that people wore. Amazingly similar across that vast step belt. Yeah. That's where you are right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was, we're in forest step, I think, would be the appropriate. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, no, no, it's a, it's really excellent, and maybe you know we we look at like the Roman Empire and how the Mediterranean Sea made made the empire so possible because of the efficiency of communication. Exactly. But here you had this whole population of steppe nomads who were the most efficient means of getting around on the steppes as possible. You know, just like the Bedouins in the in the you know the deserts in the North Africa and the Middle East, and so so they became a, 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 a economic conduit for moving ideas and, and goods. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea, Fred. Yeah, it is. It's it's sort of the, the great blender for Eurasia. I mean, yeah. So. Well, I, I gotta say, it, it, compared to the Middle Eastern um, Bedouins and stuff, 
the Bactrian camels are a heck of a lot prettier than the, than the North African camels. <laughs> and they look even silver. There's one here that lives here in town and, and absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> so, um, okay, I, I, we're out of time. So I, I, again, I want to thank you for, if you have a couple of minutes, if you're not in a rush, hang on, I, I want to talk about one idea I had. Um, you know, I, I, today is, it, it wasn't supposed to be like crazy busy, but it did get that way. So if, you know, can, can we talk tomorrow? Would that be uh, let's save it for our Saturday meeting. Or Saturday. Yeah, Saturday is yeah. perfect. Okay, well, I'll save it. All right. It, it's great meeting all of you in Tumen. I, I, um, I'm jealous that you guys get to be in such a beautiful place. Inside. <laughs> But uh, it, it sounds like uh, a, a great, a great course, and and I hope that you enjoy uh, your next speaker. That that's Guillermo, right? Yeah, uh, early June. So yeah, right. early June second. Great, great. So All right. very, Thank you again, Fred. Fantastic, fantastic talk. Thank very you. interesting. So my pleasure. It's fun. Always fun to talk about it. Thanks. Okay. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>